Welcome to History 1301. Uh, in this presentation, we will continue on with uh, Middle Colonialism and heading into Late Colonialism. Thus far, we've talked about life in the colonies. We've talked about the Great Awakening. We've talked about John Peter Zinger case. We've uh, considered all the issues uh, surrounding triangular trade and the origins of Western economy. We've also taken a look at slavery. In this presentation, we'll start with the French and Indian Wars. We'll take a look at the interwar years, 1763 to 1775. One of the main issues that uh, we'll be talking about is salutary neglect to taxation, and it is all about the issues behind the issues. So let's uh, proceed on to the next slide, which, in which I'll set up the American colonies just before the Seven Years' War. On this slide, what I want to do is start considering some of the background issues associated with the uh, Seven Years' War, also known in America as the French and Indian Wars. Now, to begin with, we need to go back to Europe once again, and this requires us to take a look at a long-term series of events that lead all the way back to the events of 1688. What emerged was a system, uh, a series of conflicts, and then there was a um, resolution, and then the two antagonists, France and England, would go back and um, gather allies. They would pay all the bills. They would raise taxes. They would retrain their men and regather up all their forces. And then they would uh, engage in the next round of warfare. And this was the War of Jenkins Era, the War of the Spanish Secession, the War of the Austrian Secession, the First and Second Dutch War. There was just one after another, after another, after another. So as we're going into the Seven Years' War, I want everybody to understand that what is in the background on this is this mutual antagonism and this emerging conflict that exists between the French and the English. And this had gone on for a long, long time, uh, well back into the, uh, into the 1600s. So uh, one of the underlying problems to, that will lead to the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian Wars, is, if you'll take a look at the map that's on the left-hand side of the slide, one of the uh, odd things that emerges about the English charters, and we've talked about these charters again and again and again so far in this class, well, one of the strange things that emerges about these is that the colonials begin to interpret, reinterpret the uh, uh, land restrictions in their charters. And the colonials interpreted the land claims to their charters in a, in a strange way. They began to consider that their charters were coast-to-coast -coast charters. In other words, there was no western boundaries to many of these charters. They had been issued by the kings, the successive kings of England, and um, their eastern boundaries were associated with the coastline, but there was no western boundaries. So in short, you can kind of see that Virginia, the colony of Virginia, was claiming everything out to, in effect, um, Oregon and, and California. North Carolina was claiming everything all the way out to the middle of California. Pennsylvania was really, con they were uh, claiming everything all the way out to really central Oregon. Uh, Massachusetts was claiming stuff that they had no meaningful claim to. Uh, their claims were reaching way, way out into the west. Well, naturally, the Native Americans, when they found out about this, they actually did not like that idea. And uh, as things are beginning to emerge here as we're going into 1754, the Native Americans are finding out that the English are claiming everything out to the West Coast. Now, the English had no meaningful legal claim to that, except that their charters indicated that there was no Western bo westward boundaries. So once again, we've talked about this before many times in this class, uh, the French are allied to the Native Americans, and I've suggested to you guys before on many occasions that as time goes along, this mutually beneficial relationship between the French and the Native Americans in that Paisian hot region, that area in and around the Great Lakes, is going to turn into a military relationship. And so here we are, finally, 1754, going into the French and Indian Wars, the Seven Years' War, the Native Americans especially are calling upon that relationship with the French 
And they are wanting that, that military relationship to come into fruition. Now, during this whole time, really from the 1500s, uh, well throughout the 1600s, and now here into well into the 1700s, the French have been routinely supplying the Native Americans with musket shot and powder. And so we're talking about the Iroquoian tribes, the Shawnees, the Ojibwas, all of those various tribes that are uh, active in the Paisley and Hunt region. They are allied to the French, and they are uh, they're emerging as being you know really quite heavily armed. So another uh, reminder here, number one, land equals money. And as we saw, uh, the English are going to continue to try and grab a hold of that land. And they don't care about this relationship between the French and the Indians. In fact, they see that as a direct threat. So the English are continually uh, being very, very hungry uh, for the land. Another issue uh, that needs to be addressed, um, what we're talking about here is the colonies acting uh, in a very independent way. Now in 1688 and uh, again and again and again we've seen that the colonies are acting independently in terms of colonial defense. So although back in England there's a strong motive in Parliament to maintain the peace as long as they can, uh, again uh, a reminder there, uh, they're going through another rebuilding phase after the last war, the, the War of the Austrian Secession. And so Parliament wants a long period of peace, but the colonies want to grab the land. And in order to grab the land, you know, we're just starting that five-step process again. Uh, they, they exercise this this coast-to-coast -coast charter business, and they're going to run into the French and their Native American allies. But what's important about this is they're all acting independently. In other words, Virginia is acting with the best interest of Virginia. That's what the rich, wealthy, elite landowners in Virginia want. In Pennsylvania, they're going to act within the best interest of Pennsylvania. That's what the local elite want. They want more land. Everybody's wanting more land. So, in conclusion on this slide then, there's a lot of dynamics that are going on here. There's the French versus the English who are antagonistic in Europe. And all of the major players in Europe are just waiting around for the next round of combat. In the colonies, all of the colonies are acting with their own best self-interests. Land equals money, and they're rereading all of their charters, and they're claiming everything all the way out to the West Coast. This is nothing but naked greed. The colonists do not care about this relationship between the French and the Indians, and in fact see that as a direct threat to their interest. So we have all of these various dynamics come together all at once. So let's go on to the next slide then and go ahead and get the war kicked off, which is going to happen in 1754. So, ladies and gentlemen, the year is 1754. Here we are taking a look at the slide. And, uh, again, there's all this antagonism between the French, the Indians, and versus the, uh, versus the English. And there's all this antagonism back in uh, Europe against, really, Prussia, uh, uh, England, versus the French and the Austrians. Okay? They're all getting ready to just get ready for the next bout. So, in the colonies... The French began to stake out a large tract of land. In other words, they began to establish a border between the Native American lands in the west and the British colonies along the coast. And they're doing this, the French are staking out this land at the request of their Native American allies. So starting really in uh, Fort Duquesne, which is modern day Pittsburgh, uh, the French began to set out into this disputed land and they begin just basically setting up a, a sign saying you know this is the land of the French stay out and uh, as it turns out historians have recently located some of these actual markers and they're carved into stones uh, they'll put the French will carve into stones uh, the, the, the symbol of the King of France which is a fleur-de-lis uh, they'll set up signs they'll set up uh, border markers all along this this disputed area well, in Virginia, the colony of Virginia, uh, the governor of Virginia then, uh, a, a man named Dinwiddie, Governor, governor Dinwiddie, D-I-N-W-I-D-D-Y, Dinwiddie, uh, he got all nervous about this and got all upset about it, and so he dispatched 
a uh, an energetic young officer to talk to the French and stop this business. So this energetic young officer of Virginia militia sets out. Uh, he encounters the French uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you can see kind of down there in the blue in the lower left of the map at Fort Necessity. Okay, this energetic young officer encounters the French. He has uh, some Native American allies with him and the French, obviously, they have some Native American allies with them. Well, a discussion ensues and uh, during the middle of the discussion, the Native American allies of the American officer killed the French officer just reached out with a tomahawk and basically killed him because to him to this Native American that was the enemy and there was no reason to talk to these guys well to make a long story short this actually precipitated the war and uh, this young officer uh, found himself surrounded by the French and their Native American allies and um, dug in and so he stayed uh, kinda dug in for a day or two wondering what to do his position like really really bad and to make a long story short he was captured well the French officer who was killed was not just some individual he wasn't just some French captain out there in the middle of the woods you know doing what he was supposed to be doing in fact this was a nephew to none other than the King of France Louis the 14th in other words, the French officer whose brains were bashed out in this encounter was royalty, the highest royalty. So the French immediately, they, they captured this, this young officer of Virginia militia, and then they sent a message all the way back to France saying, listen, uh, your majesty the king, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, in this case, your nephew has been killed out here on the frontier. What do you want us to do? In the meantime, while that message was going all the way back to France, the French got all nervous and released this young officer of Virginia militia. And he went scurrying back to Virginia and told Governor Dinwiddie, listen, you know, this fight is broken out and it was inadvertent, it's all a big accident, but the French are out there and, you know, they captured me in a fight and what do you want to do? So Governor Dinwiddie a royal governor of Virginia sent a message to the King of England, in this case George III, I'm sorry, George II, we'll get to him in a minute, saying, listen, the French are invading our territory, and what do you want us to do? Well, this enterprising young officer of American, of Virginia militia, who was trying very desperately, actually, to do a good job on the off chance that he might be accepted as a British regular officer. This was none other than George Washington, as in our George Washington, President, first President of the United States, later General of the Continental Army. He was this Virginia officer uh, who was out there, and as it turns out, he basically, George Washington, our guy, started the Seven Years' War. Now, to make a long story short, ladies and gentlemen, I want to try and be clear on this. All of this happened in 1754. And this just ignites the fuse which begins the actual war two years later. To try to help you guys to remember the dates on this conflict, the conflict will end in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris. And it's referred to as the Seven Years' War. So if you'll back up from 1763, you'll find out that it should begin in 1756, seven years earlier which is true. So here's George Washington in 1754. He gets captured. This French officer gets killed and so the message goes back to uh, King Louis that you know basically these English are up to no good. A message goes from Virginia to King George II saying look the French are up to no good. And that starts the fuse that will actually ignite this powder keg of antagonism between the British the French, the Prussians, the Russians, the Austrians, everybody else from Europe, two years later. In the intervening two years, what's going to happen is all of these guys, all of these European powers will begin to make alliances. They're going to start getting all of their finances in orders. So in short, it'll be the British allied to the Prussians.
and it'll be the Prussians against the, the Austrians who are allied to the French. And then later on, the Russians will come in against the Prussians. Which is why I'm not going to talk about the Seven Years' War in the context of the European conflict. I only want to talk about the Seven Years' War in the context of what's going on in America. Let's ignore the Seven Years' War as it happens in Europe. Let's work on the Seven Years' War as it takes place in America. Now, there are a couple of books that I want you to uh, be aware of. And um, Julian Corbett wrote The Seven Years' War. Uh, that was right at the turn of the last century, but it's really still the very best book on the Seven Years' War. Fred Anderson wrote uh, uh, the next best thing to this, and it's called The Crucible of War. Uh, Fred Anderson, uh, he's a professor up in the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, I'm sorry, in Boulder right now. And uh, The Crucible of War, awesome book, and it really talks about the Seven Years' War. So... 1756, the war breaks out. And again, both sides to both sides, this is not completely unexpected. But uh, they're scrambling very hard to pull themselves together. Now, back in England, the prime minister at the time was William Pitt the Elder. We've run into William Pitt the Younger in the context of the end of the slave trade. So this was his grandfather, William Pitt the Elder. And William Pitt concluded that what he wants to do in terms of big strategy now, we're talking about big, big strategy about how to win the war. He wants to try and fight as much of the war as he can in the New World in order to keep French troops pinned down in America. So to do this, he sends Jeffrey Amherst, a general there, you can see his picture on the slide there, and he sends Jeffrey Amherst over to the New World, over to the colonies, to try and unify these guys and fight, fight, fight the French in what is today Canada. Now, Jeffrey Amherst, to make a, very long, to make a long story short, he has a very difficult time with this. In other words, once again, the individual colonies don't want to unify for national defense. So Amherst has to go begging for troops, uh, and money from each individual colony. He has a hard time doing this. However, as time goes on, the colonies become more and more, the colonists become more and more enthusiastic about the war. In other words, they can see something in it for them, which is to say they're going to grab all that western land. Now, there's a lot of battles and uh, combat associated with the Seven Years' War, but the only thing I want you guys to know about is Lewisburg, the Battle of Lewisburg. You can see it kind of up there near the top of the slide, the top of the map there. So Lewisburg is going to be besieged from June 8th to July 26th, 1758. Now, think about that for just a moment. This is done, broadly speaking, with a whole lot of American colonial effort. In other words, and please make a strong note on this, the American colonials will tax themselves. They'll supply men, they'll supply equipment, they'll supply money, they'll supply ships, blankets, food, equipment. And the colonials will make a tremendous effort to grab the port city of Lewisburg. Now, you don't have to be a military strategist to figure this out. Lewisburg is a big giant port and if one controls Lewisburg then it's very difficult for French ships to get to Canada. If you follow the line, that red line kind of from uh, right to left that goes down the St. Lawrence Seaway and the St. Lawrence River down to uh, Quebec and Montreal, you'll see that if you control the port of Lewisburg you can close off that sea approach to Quebec. So what's important about this? Now remember, what we're talking about here is the ocean being a highway, not a barrier. And if you control Lewisburg, you can put blockade ships out there on the ocean, patrol that stretch of ocean there, and effectively put up a roadblock onto this highway. And French troops and French supplies cannot get into Canada. And that's exactly what the British, that is to say the British and the American colonials will do. But again, the important part on this, and I want you guys to make 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 clear reference to this in your notes. It is the American colonials pulling together, supplying colon colony by colony. They're supplying men, troops, ships, taxation money. They're doing everything they can to grab Lewisburg and to uh, you know try and grab Canada. They have a territorial interest. They're well motivated to do this.
Now, it isn't easy, and James, Jeffrey Amherst had a hard time getting the colonials to do what they needed to do to contribute here. So, on that note, uh, I want you guys to make sure that the, the Americans, they're, they're doing their share. And this will be in contrast to the very next slide. So, one last thing. Uh, there's a lot of combat going on here. There's a lot of things that are going on here. But the only thing I really want you to know at this stage is the contribution that the colonials are doing for Lewisburg, the besieging and the taking of Lewisburg. So, let's go on to the next slide and uh, figure out what the British are doing in this thing because they feel like they have a, this is going to set up a, a kind of a conflict between England and the colonies, which is going to lead to the American War of Independence as we're moving forward. All right, on this slide, what I want you guys to really take a look at here is uh, kind of the flip side of the coin here. And this is Britain's contribution to the French and Indian Wars, the Seven Years' War, in America. Now, we've already pointed out in the previous slide that Amherst is going to be trying to grab Lewisburg, and he's successful at that with colonial help. But then, the very next year, 17, uh, 1758, 1759. What happens is that Britain, in 1759, uh, I'm sorry, in 1758, they start gathering all these forces. And in 1759, they will send uh, one of their favorite generals, a guy named James Wolfe. Now, James Wolfe is a very young, dynamic uh, uh, British general. Uh, he's a little bit neurotic, I have to say. And uh, he was suffering from some health issues. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But Britain starts sent, gathering these men, gathering these supplies, gathering a big giant fleet, and they send it off to the New World, to the colonies, to grab Canada from the French. Now the Canadians, I'm sorry, in the, the French, in the meantime, they want to save Canada for themselves. They actually want to help their Native American allies. They feel that there's, there's a good investment in uh, Canada. So they've sent a lot of reinforcements as well. Uh, men and troops, cannons, muskets, shot and powder, they've expended a huge amount of money to try to save Canada for France. Well, in 1759, uh, Wolfe arrives, James Wolfe arrives, he's got this huge fleet. Um, in most of the accounts, the Navy does not get enough credit. Uh, Admiral Charles Saunders is going to do a great job in making sure that the fleet gets into the St. Lawrence Seaway and then navigates its way all the way down to Quebec. Now remember, this is a huge fleet in the Age of Sail. And Saunders is going to support uh, James Wolfe, who is an army general, with all the help that he can. So we'll get on to the actual Battle of Quebec in a minute, which is going to be decisive. But I want to just go through the slide for just a minute. Now, on the verbiage here, it says, For Great Britain, the element of the war in North America was a sideshow. And this is just a reminder. The war itself was growing in size. To be clear, the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, was a global a conflict. Uh, Britain is going to be fighting as far away as India. To be clear, the Battle of Plassey, 1759, was fought all the way out in India, and this was decisive. The French had a foothold in India, and the British are going to go all the way out there and beat the French in India. And this is going to, that means that India is going to fall to the British. They're going to have tremendous amount of control in India, which will be important for the British Empire later on. Furthermore, Britain is teaming up with the Prussians, and that is to say, Frederick the Great, that guy. And so they're going to be beating the crap out of the French in Europe. Then they'll beat the Austrians, and then they're going to beat the Russians. 1759 is called the uh, Anna Mirabilis the year of miracles and it's just an amazing time for the British they're really starting to gain empire they're becoming a global power however in um, contrast to that for the British colonies in North America this is critical in other words they are genuinely fighting for their survival if this thing should fail they will be permanently tied to the coast now, they are very, very greedy for more and more land. They have tremendous land claims uh, far out into the west, land claims that they cannot substantiate. But what do these colonists want? They are hungry for land because land equals money. There are more and more people coming into the colonies. Um, the uh, population is growing 
Uh, it's almost uh, to the two million mark, and there is a huge demand for more and more land to the west. So as we go through this thing, and we're going to go on to the Battle of Quebec next, I just want you guys to be thinking ahead what Britain is going to get out of the war when this thing is over. What are the American colonies going to be getting out of the war when it is over with? So lots of bitter conflict that is going on here. But again, uh, what I want you guys to concentrate is the Battle of Lewisburg, which the colonials feel they've done a great job on. And then the Battle of Quebec, where all of the forces, the admiral, the fleet, the troops, the general, everybody's coming from England. Okay, so let's go on to the Battle of Quebec, which is decisive. All right, what we're talking about now is the Battle of Quebec, 1759, June 1759. Now, again, uh, in this particular uh, uh, event in British history, um, General Wolfe, General James Wolfe, is going to take the city of Quebec from the French. Now, he's aided, very, aided, very ably aided by Admiral Charles Saunders, who doesn't get enough credit here. And I just want you guys to think about the... Um, effort at navigation that Admiral Saunders had to do. He's got a huge fleet, almost a hundred ships. He had to go down this very, very narrow river. He's sailing against the current. It's very, very narrow. He has only the wind to drive his ships. Imagine, if you will, I guess an analogy would be driving around deep in the heart of downtown Dallas in your car in reverse and only using your mirrors to drive around in with like three times too much traffic. In other words, you're middle of the uh, middle of the day in a huge traffic jam, trying to drive backwards uh, with your rear, rear view mirrors. And that's basically what Saunders was having to do. It's something along those lines, just to give you an idea. So to make a long story short here, uh, James Wolfe and this admiral and this huge body of troops arrive from Britain. Now they've got to move fast. In other words, they've got to attack the French, they've got to secure the city, they've got to go further upstream and try to grab Montreal all before the winter closes in because the fleet will be trapped in the St. Lawrence River and the St. Lawrence Seaway by the ice. So they've got to get in, do what they need to do, and then the fleet has to get out. On the French side is our friend uh, Montcalm, and we've run into General Montcalm before. Just check your notes. General Montcalm. Now, General Montcalm has had a very positive relationship uh, with the Native Americans. Uh, he has mobilized uh, the, the French Courier de Bois, all these voyageurs who have been living in this part of the region for, you know, well over a century now. General Montcalm has also gotten all sorts of uh, reinforcements from France. And uh, on this note, I want you guys to take a look at the map. And you can see there where the city of Quebec lies. And just outside of there uh, are all those little blue, dark blue uh, squares, those rectangulars. Now those are French units. Now I know you ladies and gentlemen have no idea about this, but those uh, are the names of the various French units who are involved here on the Plains of Abram. And these are the most top shelf, most important French units in the entire French army. Uh, kind of at the bottom there, you can see uh, militia. Fine, those are French voyageurs, the, the, the French regular French infantry. But then above that is the Royal Roussillon, the Royal Languedoc, the Royal Guyane, the Lassar Regiment, the Regiment Bayern. These are the most important, most famous units in the entire French army. Now, what's important about that, ladies and gentlemen, just think about what William Pilt the Elder was trying to do. And he said this at the time. He wants to pin down a whole lot of French units in Canada fighting the British in Canada. That way they are not in Europe fighting uh, Britain and her allies. So this is like really, really, in other words, uh, um, William Pitt the Elder, his strategy has worked. Those French units are there and they're not fighting in Europe. So this is how it works out, ladies and gentlemen. Saunders and... General Wolfe will go up and down the St. Lawrence River there looking for a way to land. And Montcalm is outwitting them. Time after time after time, Montcalm is outwitting them. In other words, there's a real big cliff, and you can kind of see that in the um, 
the upper left portion of the slide there, that sort of a, that, that picture there, that, that rendering, that artistic rendering of what's going on here. It's basically a cliff. And the French will sail upriver, and they're going to try and find a way up, and Montcalm will be there to be waiting for them. And then the, the British will sail back up the river, uh, kind of in the north channel there, and Montcalm will be waiting for them. And they're trying to trying to get onto the beach. They're trying to make this landing, and they can't find a way up. They can't find a way up. Montcalm is outwitting them. And weeks go by, and poor James Wolfe, uh, he's just driving everybody crazy. He's a little bit neurotic. He is suffering from major health problems. He has um, what they call the gravel back in those days, which are kidney stones. Evidently, he had them really, really bad. So he'll uh, just drive his commanding officers crazy, all of his subordinate commanders. He'll say, you know, I have this plan, and he'll draw them all in, and they'll wait and wait and wait, and then finally he'll say, okay, do this thing, and they'll try and do that. And then he'll say, no, 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 do that. And then, uh, okay, um, uh, let me think of a plan, let me think of a plan, let me think of a plan. And he'll keep them waiting, and keep them waiting. And they finally say, okay, do this thing. No, 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 don't do that thing. And so he's just driving them crazy. Finally, at the last minute, and James Wolfe genuinely felt he was dying. He says, okay, what we need to do is do a sneak attack. And that's what's going on in that l upper left uh, image there. Way late at night, the British got all into the ship's lifeboats, the various lifeboats from the fleet. They loaded all their soldiers into these lifeboats sort of thing. Uh, they tied rags around the oars to muffle the oars. And they waited till it was really, really dark at night. And then they went to a part of the coastline there, the, the, uh, the beach there, called Anse de Foulon. You can kind of see it on the map portion. And they sent a commando team up to the top of this. It's basically a goat path. And they sent a commando team up there, and they killed all the Frenchmen at the top of Anse de Foulon, this, this little bitty pathway that leads up. Well, after that, the rest of the British Army scrambled up there. And all night long, they kept moving up there. They kept sailing in on these rowboats. And it was all night long, and they, they kept scrambling up this little pathway and getting up there and getting up there. And more and more guys showed up up there. And finally, first thing in the morning, you know, the dawn uh, came over the horizon, and the people of Quebec and General Montcalm were horrified to see this huge British army had landed in secret all night long. And you can see them there on the map there, all those little red rectangles. Well, those are all those British units, the 58th, the 65th foot, the 28th foot, the Grenadiers. There's all these very, very famous British units. Well, the French, again, they were horrified. Montcalm sent all of his generals, you know, show up real fast. You know, I need all the reinforcements. We've got to fight this huge battle. So what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen, is we have a European-style battle fought in the New World. These soldiers are going to line up shoulder to shoulder, uh, right next to each other, and they're just going to start trading shots, basically at point-blank range. And to make a long story short, the British just outnumbered the French and just defeated them. Now, ironically, uh, James Wolfe, and we will find this out in just a minute, he will, um, he's going to be out there leading his men. Uh, he, you know, was energized right there kind of at the last minute. But uh, leading from the front is a very dangerous game because James Wolfe will stop a bullet. And just at about the lot of time that he got killed or got very badly wounded, and he'll die in just a few minutes, and we'll get to that in the next slide, um, Montcalm ironically, was killed at just about the same time. He was out there leading his men from the front, uh, cheering his men on, and a British bullet, you know, reached out and got him too. So both the generals are going to die here. But the British do win the Battle of Quebec, and they're able to capture the city. And having captured the city, that means that they control everything uh, that comes uh, up and down the St. Lawrence Seaway, and that means they control all of Canada. Control of Quebec equals control of Canada and the British have done that so again to recap the Americans felt like they did a really great job in capturing Lewisburg they taxed themselves they put forth this tremendous amount of effort they'd gotten shot and powder they'd gotten food and ships and they got they captured Lewisburg that had been the year before in 1758 that made the British attack in 1759, the Battle of Quebec, that made it possible. 
But the forces that actually captured Quebec, the fleet, the soldiers, the generals, those all came directly from Britain. So just to kind of check the block here, think this all the way through, ladies and gentlemen, both sides, the colonials and the people back in Parliament, the people back in Britain, felt like the capture of Canada, uh, they felt like they had done the, the, the greatest portion of that. And this is going to lead to a lot of problems later on. Now, the next slide is uh, an allegory of the Battle of Quebec. Uh, it's a very famous painting of the event, and the allegory really says it all about these attitudes. And this is going to be very critical as we're running up to uh, uh, the American War of Independence. So let's stop right here, go on to the next slide, and take a look at how both sides view their role in the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian Wars in America. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's try and do something that I've always tried to do in this, in this class during this course, and that's a little bit of image analysis. And what's going on here is really uh, two separate views of this, this struggle, the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian Wars as is known in America. And, and the artist here is a guy named Benjamin West. Now, Benjamin West was born in America. He goes back to uh, England. He's a gifted artist, and he takes all of his artistic training uh, back in England. And so he's painting this for an English audience. But all of the underlying troubles, in other words, all the misunderstandings that are going to stem from uh, the American War of, in, of, of the Seven Years' War, uh, the French and Indian Wars, are, they're, they're, they're illustrated right here. And so let's just do a little bit of image analysis, because there's a lot of allegory going on in this picture. There's a lot of metaphors going on here. So first, let's take a look at where the viewer's eye is drawn. And the sun, which, you know, kind of a light to the dark, okay? So the lighter side is, in other words, where the light is emanating from, is in the upper left-hand side of the picture. And this is, naturally, that's the British side. The, the upper right-hand side, that's the French side. So just that part of the allegory, uh, you know, it's, it's the British, and they're bringing uh, enlightenment, they're bringing the good, they're bringing uh, uh, liberty, they're bringing uh, equality, they're bringing all these positive things that we would associate, um, you know, with British government. And, and Benjamin West is not making any, uh, any bones about this. On the dark side there, on the uh, uh, kind of the upper right, well, that's the French side. And oh my goodness me, it's all ignorance and uh, these terrible things are going on and oppression. And it's just, you know, it's, it's this uh, monarchic government in France that's just uh, all powerful. And it's just really, really dark. Now, the second thing that kind of emerges out of this is where the eye is drawn to. And your eye is naturally drawn primarily to the figure uh, in the very middle of, of, the, uh, of the image here, of the painting here. And that is, in fact, General James Wolfe. Now, at the time, as, of, as I recall, he was like in his mid-20s, uh, 26, 27 years old, uh, at the very flower of his youth. And uh, the, the people of England really thought of him as being, you know, uh, the savior of the British Army. He's this young, energetic, uh, forward-thinking officer. He's written a whole lot about uh, the earlier operations of the Seven Years' War. He's been very, very active. And he's just the darling of the British people. And certainly after his death, he's just going to be idolized by the British as this hero that they've sent over there. And so sure enough, there he is in his last moments, his last gasp, he's dying. Uh, the guy in the blue next to him, he's one of the admirals. Uh, he's one of the Navy guys who's uh, uh, acting there, uh, uh, sort of aiding the general. And again, this is an allegory. Now, analyze this picture very, very carefully. The second place, in other words, the second place where the light is at, the second place where your eye is naturally drawn to, is sort of the soldier on the far right. If you look, he's a, and this is a British soldier, the, far, the soldier who's kind of on the far right edge. And your eye is sort of drawn to him because that's where the light goes to next. And again, this is Benjamin West, and he's all about the allegory. And what's going on here is that is the common British soldier, the ordinary British soldier who's doing all the work. 
Now we've talked about spirituality on many occasions before and how important that is. And sure enough, this British soldier has his hands clasped in front of him and he's saying a prayer. He's uttering a prayer for uh, his fallen general, the fallen hero. So the first hero of the story here is the general, the fallen general. The second hero of the story here, and that's what Benjamin West is trying to portray, is the common, ordinary British soldier who's doing all the work. Now let's evaluate kind of this crowd that's over on the middle left side. Now the figure you see there in green, he represents the American colonial. The colonial fighter, that backwoodsman, that frontiersman who's uh, come out of the woodworks to try and help the British cause. But take a look at the composition. You can't really see his face. You can see his back. His back is basically turned to you. And take a look at his hand. His hand is pointing away towards the horizon. And sure enough, this is how the British felt about the colonials. This is what they were doing all the time. Their hands are pointing away to the horizon. Take a look, you know, uh, we're pointing away. Uh, he's, now he's pointing towards the victory, and he's informing the general that, you know, he's had a victory uh, going on here, just kind of in his, da in his last gasp as he's dying, he's passing away. But the American here is playing a secondary role. And I can promise you that the Americans did not see themselves in that way. They just didn't see themselves in that fashion. Now kind of in the foreground there is the Native American. And again, take a look at the composition here. The American Indian here, the, the, this, this Iroquois or the Seneca presumably, uh, he's a British ally and he's just looking on as a sort of a disinterested party. And certainly, the Native Americans were not in any way disinterested. If you recall, uh, one of the sparks that led to the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian Wars, was a Native American killing a Frenchman right there in the presence of George Washington. And so they were not disinterested. They were very warlike. They, wanted, they, they each had their own interests. But here you can see Benjamin West kind of portraying this as a, as a, as a, he's in the foreground certainly, but he's a, a, a supine figure. He's not taking any active role. He's seated. He's just an onlooker. And that's certainly not, you know, that's just not accurate. But again, Benjamin West's audience is a British audience. So if we take this whole composition in total, uh, what emerges here? It is the Royal Navy who's helping the general. It is the general who's made the supreme sacrifice. It is the British soldier who's played the tremendous role and who very piously hopes for the best for his general. The Americans, they're in the picture, but they're a secondary figure. You can't really see their face. They're not really playing a, a tremendous role here. Instead, they're, they're pointing away to the horizon. They're, they're, they're sort of, you know, uh, they've got their back turned to the viewer. And the Native Americans, they hardly play any role at all here. They're just basically onlookers. And nothing could be further from the truth. So you can apprehend that the Americans, again, as a reminder, they've been taxing themselves. They'd, they'd sacrificed a great deal to capture Lewisburg. The capture of Lewisburg facilitated the uh, Battle of Quebec, made it possible. The Native Americans on both sides, on the French side and on the English side, are fighting very hard. Uh, they have a role to play in this thing. They Both sides have a stake in this thing. And yet, here they are portrayed as being secondary figures. Now, Benjamin West does have a British audience here, and he's really trying to reach out to them, but the underlying uh, um, disagreement about the role of the Seven Years' War is really just put on full display in this, in this painting, this allegorical image. So on that note, uh, let's get on to uh, the next slide, which is going to be talking about uh, what we get out of the Seven Years' War. So Britain, Britain gains empire, and let's see what that means. See what ha what happens. Uh, what what happens next? All right. The question that I want to ask here is, what did get Britain get out of the Seven Years' War? This is a tremendous conflict. Obviously, it really went on for really longer than seven years, but the result is the same. What Britain got out of the Seven Years' War was empire. To be clear now, we're talking about little bitty England. And on this, uh, on the map that you can see here, it's just a little speck kind of floating out there on the northern edge of Europe. And that's England. Scotland had not been part of the UK uh, for very long, only since 1707. Ireland was thought of as a sort of a colony of England, even then. 
So what did England get out of the Seven Years' War? This teeny tiny little country was able to grab all of North America, in effect everything north of Mexico. That was suddenly all English. The Russians had a tiny little claim all the way out there in Alaska, but they're not going to do anything with that. They've gotten basically all the West Indies, and from our uh, discussion over the slave trade and the triangular trade routes, we know that those islands out there, those spice islands, those sugar islands, are critically, critically important, and we'll, I'll uh, talk about that again in just a minute. They were able to grab a colony in South America. They didn't know what to do with it, and it didn't go anywhere. In other words, it's going to collapse later on, which is British Guiana. But they also grabbed India. In other words, the Portuguese have a tiny, tiny little port near Goa in India, but the British now completely dominate India. And I have below there the EIC, this is the East India Company. Again, we've talked about the East India Company before. Uh, they were uh, commissioned in 1603. Uh, that's one of the last things that Queen Elizabeth did before she died. Uh, they got their charter. And Britain has been influential in India up until this time. But they beat the French at the Battle of Plassey in India, and they kicked the French out. So the French have no influence there at all. The Spanish never had any influence. The Portuguese only have a tiny influence. And so the East India Company is going to take over India, and they're going to have a huge influence there for the next 150 years. They're basically going to plunder India. They also established a small trade mission all the way out in China. So... From this stage forward, from 1770, which the Treaty of Paris in 1763 will finalize all this, but from 1770 on, Britain has a global empire. So the question now is, uh, we need to figure out exactly what the gains of the, se of, of the Seven Years' War are. And that's, that's really the next slide. So I wanted to give you this map to give you an idea of where uh, Britain was suddenly influential at. And now in the next slide, we're going to start heading, we're drifting now towards the American War of Independence. So let's take another look at this and uh, take a look at the uh, Treaty, of seven, Treaty of Paris 1763 in greater detail. Okay, so what we want to talk about now is the Treaty of Paris 1763, which ends the Seven Years' War. Now, during the war, the British were able to grab all these different various uh, French-held islands in the Caribbean. And as we know, these are very, very critical islands for sugar, that is to say, rum production. Without that, without rum production, without sugar, uh, you know, uh, this is a, a tremendous part of the French... Uh, um, economy back at home. This is their, their overseas trading empire. And the French desperately wanted that. So the English had grabbed Guadalupe and Martinique. The French had lost two islands to the British. It's kind of right there in the middle. Guadalupe and Martinique. And these are very, very critical islands to the French. So during the Treaty of Paris 1763, the British and the French, you know, they sat down with the Prussians, the Russians, and the Austrians, and they figured this all out. And most of the Treaty of Paris 1763, I don't even want to talk about. Only the stuff that has to do with North America. So in order to get those two islands, Guadalupe and Martinique, back, the French were willing to give up all of Canada. That is to say, all of that stuff that's in pink that was not already owned by the British. The French gave up all of that stuff. They gave up everything, many hundreds of thousands of square miles. Now, again, uh, what's going on here is that the French are going to stab the Indians right in the back. The Indians had no say in this. The Indians, who'd been faithful allies to the French for over 150 years by this stage, got nothing out of the Treaty of Paris 1763. They were completely ignored by all sides. They had no say. So suddenly, these Indians, who felt themselves to be independent, they were their own nations, we've talked about this before, suddenly went from being influenced by the French to suddenly being subjects by treaty of the English crown. And the Indians had no, they had no idea about that sort of thing. They did not like that at all. When they did find out, they were like, no, that's not gonna, that didn't apply to us. But Britain grabbed all of this. And so, to be clear, 
Uh, why were the French willing to ready and able to give up all of New France? Because they had to have those two little bitty islands back. In fact, uh, those two islands are not even on this map. So how important was sugar and rum to the French? It had to be very, very critical. Now there is one other side note that I want you guys to know about on this. By this time, in other words, would have been uh, um, would have been the underlying economic cause for the French to have a good relationship with the Native Americans was, as you well know, the fur trade. And I'm sorry to say this and put it in such crass economic terms, but uh, fur had just gone out of fashion in France. By the time frame we're talking about, the mid 1700s, um, the avail availability of rum had made sea travel all the way out to China uh, very profitable, and I'm sorry to say very positive, one more time, very possible and very profitable. So one of the uh, products that is coming back from China to Europe was silk. And very rapidly, the French demanded to know how silk was actually produced. So the French were able to get a hold of um, silkworms. And then after a while, they were able to figure out that silkworms uh, depended upon mulberry trees uh, for reproduction. In other words, silkworms only eat mulberry tree leaves. And the French finally figured that out. So French fashions began to be built around silk, which was becoming an internal product of the French. And so fur just went out of fashion and silk became fashionable. Everybody was wearing French silk. So there was no meaningful economic reason for the French to hang on to these, uh, these territories up around Canada. So they simply threw the Indians under the bus. Now, England gained empire. But the thing is that the war had lasted seven years, and the British had been trying to project power all over planet Earth. And they sent this, amazing, this tremendous force to the colonies to help the colonials fight the war. So uh, after seven years of uh, near constant combat, uh, the British were deep, deep in debt. So the issue that comes out of the Seven Years' War that is unique to the entire British Empire was how was this going to be paid? And so let's take a look at uh, what happens next in this step. Now what we're starting to drift in, in other words, that's all I have to say uh, of the, that's all I have to say about the Seven Years' War. So what we want to do now is start really taking that first few steps towards the American War of Independence. That's going to be about the political background, and then we're going to take a look at an overview of the progressions of events from 1763 to 1775, which is the opening shots of the American War of Independence. So let's take a look at the political background. This is going to get really, really complex. If you thought it was complex up to this point, okay, this is going to be as bad as the events of 1688. So let's move on to the next slide. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, don't get nervous about this slide. Let me give you the disclaimer up front. If I would have known, wanted you to know all of the issues that are listed on this very, very complex slide, I would have given it to you as a handout. But I do want to give you an idea of some of the things that are going to be driving this split between the colonies and the government back in England. Now, the umbrella issue here is we're drifting towards the American War of Independence. If we zoom down just a little bit, we need to take a look at, at, a, at a phenomenon that is becoming important here. And it's, it's an issue that had been in the background politically for a long, long time now. And it's called salutary neglect. Now, salutary neglect, let's break that phrase down into two separate elements, the salutary part and the neglect part. The salutary part, very simply, okay, now again, take a good strong note on this. The salutary part is that everybody in the colonies and everyone in England agreed that the population in the colonies were English. The salutary part, people in England, that is to say the government in England, the royal government, and the people in the colonies, everybody agreed that the people in the colonies were English. They were subjects of the English crown. That's the salutary part. The neglect part, 
the colonies, the subjects of the English crown in the colonies could rule themselves. In other words, they did not need direct rule from Parliament. They could form their own governments in accordance with their charters, and they could have a great deal of autonomy. Now, as a reminder, I've said this many times in class. Let me say it one more time here. The English Constitution is that body of laws on the books and in effect at any given time. If you need to see the English Constitution, you need to go into a great big giant book, full of a, a big giant room full of law books, and that was the English Constitution. So let's put that into practical application in the post Seven Year War context, because this is where the split is going to start. Now back in England, and I'm just going to pick down through here and just take a couple of take a take a look at a couple of these issues, and just show you how the constitutions in England and the constitution in the colonies was beginning to split. At issue here now is salutary neglect. But let's take a look at this. Uh, for instance, if you'll go on down there, let's just take a look at the English Civil War. Now, the English Civil War, 1642 to 1649, had nothing whatever to do with what was happening in the colonies. The effect in the colonies was to drive up immigration. People were uh, escaping from England during the English Civil War. But at the same time, and Fisher points this out in his book, uh, uh, Albion Seed, at the same time, young, able-bodied men in the colonies were going back to England to fight the English Civil Wars. So the English Civil War, now in 1649, if you recall, King Charles the, the I was beheaded, and then we had a long period called the Interregnum where Parliament was completely in charge, and there was no royal, uh, royal family. There was none. Uh, they'd all escaped back to uh, uh, France. Well, what did that do to the colonies? Nothing. It had no effect on the colonies. The colonies continued to rule themselves, to govern themselves. Uh, the landed elite in the colonies continued to exer exert a tremendous amount of uh, uh, um, rule in the colonial governments. So there was no a meaningful uh, a connection between the colonies and England as a result of the English Civil War. It did not change the constitutions of the colonies at all. But in England, the English Civil Wars had a huge effect on the British on the British Constitution. From Parliament being, not being um, an integral part of government, a critical part of government, suddenly because of the uh, um, English Civil Wars, government could no longer function without Parliament. Another uh, issue going on here. Um, let's take a look at. Um, Increasing debt. Now, increasing debt, and uh, the book that is important about this is a book by a guy named Jan von Gleet, and he talks about the fiscal military state. And he says here, okay, England is starting to finance war upon war upon war. And we've talked about that before. But back in the colonies, they kept saying, no, you know, we will tax ourselves if we have conflict with the Native Americans, and we're not going to centralize it all. If you recall, the events of 1688 in the colonies, uh, they were not going to put up with the Dominion of New England. They wanted their own elite to rule the colonies. And in an emergency like the Seven Years' War, they taxed themselves. They provided troops and ships if they needed that. But they would not unify in order to fight off any sort of an, in of, uh, an enemy. By contrast, in the colonies, if you'll take a look, right about in the middle, uh, affairs with Native Americans. Well, now it turns out that every colony had to come up with laws unique to that colony to deal with the Native Americans. The laws down there in the Carolinas dealing with Native Americans had nothing to do with the laws in Massachusetts where the Native Americans had been eradicated in the 1670s. In New York, where there was a continuing problem with the Iroquois that would go on well into the 1780s, okay, there had to be continually uh, uh, new laws emerging dealing with the Native Americans. Contrast all that with Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, as I've pointed out on multiple occasions, they had a very positive relationship with the Native Americans. The Quakers would not put up with dirty dealing with the Native Americans. So their laws were completely different. 
Well, back in England, there were no laws dealing with Native Americans in, let's say, Yorkshire or Sussex or Wessex or Yorkshire or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lancaster. There was no place in English law in England for dealing with Native Americans because obviously there were no Native Americans there. So these are diverging constitutions. The Constitution in England was that law, body of law on the books at any given time. So because there's a separate situation in England as there is in the colonies, and the colonies are becoming uh, more and more sophisticated, there's more and more people there, uh, these, these constitutions are simply beginning to diverge. Now this was all right as long as there was no conflict of interest between the colonies and the government back in England. But in the post Seven Year War era, there was a very big problem. And that is going to become clear on the very next slide. So just be thinking about these divergent constitutions, the constitutions uh, associated with the various charters in the various colonies, and the broader constitution, the Constitution of England. Okay, let's go on to the next slide and start start that first few hesitant steps towards the American War of Independence.